Welcome everybody. I'm gonna post this one more time in the chat for those of you who just joined since we now know that you can't see previous chats um, unless you've just joined. And uh, my name is Phoebe. I'm from the community team at Elastic. And today we're gonna to be getting a presentation uh, from Lisa Jung, who is a developer advocate from the community team. This is really exciting for us because this is the first meetup that we've done in Austin in quite a while. And so we're really happy to be um, presenting and doing a meetup. And yes, it's in the virtual space, <laughs> unfortunately, but hopefully we'll get back to in person at some point here in the future. And let's see, um, Lisa, if you wanna go ahead and advance to the next slide. So um, as I mentioned and, and I threw in the chat, um, we're really uh, super dedicated to pro providing a positive experience. And so we would love for everyone to review our code of contact. Um, it's, it's pretty basic stuff. Basically, we just wanna be respectful of each other. Um, and then uh, change the two in your chat to all panelists and attendees. That will help uh, everyone see your questions if you ask them. There is also a Q&A feature in Zoom webinar, so you can use the Q&A feature as well. I'll be monitoring those while um, Lisa is uh, doing her presentation. And so I can help uh, if, if you have any questions um, that you'd like to answer as we go through. Lisa, I don't know, are you gonna have pauses where folks can uh, drop in questions or will you just run through the presentation and then yes. do it at the end? So I was thinking about doing a Q&A session at the end. Okay, great. So even if um, you have questions as we're going, please feel free to drop them into the chat so we don't forget about them. I know sometimes the content can go pretty quickly. So um, don't be afraid to just throw your question in the chat. We will definitely get to it towards the end uh, when we do the Q&A. And um, the lastly, I just kind of want to give a little bit of a, um, a promotion here to uh, our Elastic Meetup Group for the Americas region. This is our virtual meetup group. So if you're interested in seeing any of the other meetups that we um, put out there uh, all across the country, you can go to this uh, meetup group and join it. And then you'll see all of our, our recent and upcoming events. You can also go to our community Slack workspace. This is free and open to everyone. Um, it's a great place to connect with other elasticians uh, and folks who are using Elastic uh, and ask questions. And then we also have a community YouTube channel and this is where we post our recordings of our meetups. So if you're interested in catching a meetup that you weren't able to make in person um, or at the virtual time, then you can head to the YouTube channel and pick it up there. And also it's a great way to learn some new things about Elastic and we do have playlists based on different kinds of use cases. So definitely check those out. And then lastly, if we can go to the next slide, Lisa, um, I did want to mention we do have a contributor program. So if you're part of the Elastic community and you're using Elastic and maybe you're writing um, a blog post about it or you're sharing a tutorial, maybe on Dev.2 or you're um, setting up an event, maybe you set up a meetup. We would love to uh, give you and incentivize you uh, some, some prizes. So we have a program to do that. And if you grab that uh, QR code, it will take you to some more information about how we how we do our contributor program. But it's our way of sort of making some friendly competition and then also um, helping to give back to our community and, and kind of incentivize them to do more things. So anything like presentations, um, and if you do code submissions, we do obviously have an open source, uh, many open source projects, and we rely on contributors just like you to contribute to our code, help catch bugs, things like that. So uh, check out the contributor program. And without further ado, I'll hand it over to Lisa. Lisa, would you like to introduce yourself? All right, thank you so much for the great intro, Phoebe. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Beginner's Crash Course to the Elastic Stack. My name is Lisa Jung, and I'm a developer advocate at Elastic. Now, I'm so excited to be here. This is my very first workshop with Elastic since I joined the company a month and a half ago. So thank you so much for being here. I'll do a quick intro. 
I love building full stack apps with JavaScript and Ruby. And before I got into tech, I was training to become a scientist. So I love geeking out of our data and using the Elastic Stack to find answers. Okay, so let's kick this off with a question. Who here has ever used the Elastic Stack before? So in the chat window, type yes if you have and type no if you haven't. I'll give you guys about 10 seconds to answer. Okay, so it seems like there's a good mix here. So for those of you who have never used the Elastic Stack before, the chances are you're actually using a lot of apps that are powered by the Elastic Stack. For example, if you have ever searched for a ride on Uber, Elastic is the engine that powers the Uber marketplace that connects you to the driver. Now, if you ever had mad cravings for tacos around 10 o'clock at night and were searching for open restaurants on Yelp, Elastic is powering that search. So it's hidden under a lot of the apps and websites that you use on a daily basis, which few of them are shown here. So what is the Elastic Stack exactly? If you're a developer working with data, the Elastic Stack is a great tool to have on your belt. From the very beginning, the Elastic Stack has been free and open, and it consists of Beats, Logstash, Elasticsearch, and Kibana. And with the stack, you could take data from any source and in any format, then search, analyze, and visualize it in real time. So some of the most popular use cases for the Elastic Stack are logging, metrics, security analytics, and business analytics. For example, the Elastic Stack is used to store and analyze log data. And an example for all the gamers out there, Blizzard uses the Elastic Stack to analyze gamer and server events. So if the players experience a slowdown or an error, their monitoring team would use the Elastic Stack to figure out what's causing it. Now, it could also be used to gather metrics. So one of my favorite examples is a Mars Curiosity rover. So it sends telemetry, sensor, and photo data into the Elastic Stack for analysis. So if someone wanted to know how hot Mars is on an hourly basis, you can go and pull the data. Now with the Elastic Stack, you could analyze security issues and threats within an environment as well. So you probably have used Slack at work or at meetups before. And what you may have not realized is that Slack uses the Elastic Stack in their security operations center to secure communications through their channels. Lastly, if you have ever used Tinder, you probably didn't realize that the Elastic Stack was helping you find your match. So this is a technology behind using geolocations to match people together. And it's also used to analyze business needs and to build custom applications so you could analyze and learn from the data. So for example, Tinder relies on the Elastic Stack to analyze and predict which people a user will swipe right on or which people will swipe right on that user and when there's a match. Now, all of these use cases are made possible by the Elastic Stack. So to recap, the Elastic Stack has been free and open since the beginning. And it's a collection of products called Beats, Logstash, Elasticsearch, and Kibana. And these products can be mixed and matched to serve a specific use case. But before we delve into how all of these products could work together and what they do, we're going to start with the basics and focus on few products at a time. The Beginner's Crash Course is a series of workshops. And throughout the series, we'll delve into each product, learn when to use it, and how to use it. So by the end of the series, you can identify which products of the Elastic Stack would best serve your use case and know how to integrate these products into your app. So today I'm gonna introduce you to Elasticsearch in Kibana. Okay, so here's the game plan. We'll start off by going over a scenario where Elasticsearch and Kibana could come in handy. Then we'll go over the basic architecture of Elasticsearch. And we'll wrap up by running CRUD operations with Elasticsearch and Kibana. 
Now, this is the hands-on part of the workshop. Now, before the workshop, I've asked you to download Elasticsearch and Kibana and have these running on your computer. And we'll play with these in a little bit, all right? So let's get started. Elasticsearch is known as the heart of the Elastic Stack. And this is where you could store, search, and analyze your data. So let's go for a scenario where Elasticsearch may come in handy. Now imagine you're the lead developer responsible for building and maintaining an online grocery shop. And using the search bar, millions of customers will be searching for products that they want to buy. So you currently have a full stack app connected to a database. Now the database contains all product data along with other data we're collecting from the app. So when a customer searches for a product on your site, the request is sent to the server, which in turn looks up the product within the database. And the product info is sent back so it can be rendered on the customer's browser. Now, a great search experience is key to have your customers to buy and keep coming back to your platform. And we want the customers to get fast and relevant results, no matter the scale. So with the current setup I showed you in the previous slide, the chances are you may be working with a huge product data set stored in a relational database. And your data is scattered among multiple tables. And fetching data from these tables could cause a lag in getting search results to your customers. And that could be a huge turnoff. Now, another important factor in search experience is relevancy. So the whole point of search is finding relevant data fast. And we want to be able to set criteria to have the most relevant results up at the top and least relevant at the bottom. So for example, let's say a customer is searching for peanut butter and there are a ton of different brands. But what if a customer wanted to see peanut butter from highest to lowest rated brands? Or what if the customer is searching for sriracha hot sauce and misspells it? I mean, we still want to pull up relevant search results even though the customer's spelling doesn't exactly match the product data. And database is not equipped to handle all of that. So if you're in a situation where speed and relevance of your search is an important aspect of your work, Elasticsearch could come in really handy. So how does it look when Elasticsearch is connected to your app? Well, when a user sends a search query from your website, the request is sent to the server, which sends a search query to Elasticsearch. Now, Elasticsearch is built to send relevant results fast to the server and which processes the info and sends the results back to the browser. Now, we'll go over how Elasticsearch does that in the later part of the workshop. But for now, let's go even one step further. So through your app, you're collecting a lot of data such as order information, purchase history, the list goes on and on. And we want to make use of that data. For example, we want to know what was the revenue for last month or you know, which products are most popular. To answer these questions, you can enter relevant data in Elasticsearch so you could search and analyze your data to answer your questions. But data is so much easier to understand if you could visualize it. And this is where Kibana comes in, which helps you visualize and manage your data. So think of Kibana as a web interface to the data stored in Elasticsearch. It searches, views, and interacts with your Elasticsearch data. So if you had a question about what is the most popular product or what was our revenue during Christmas season, you would enter relevant data in Elasticsearch and from Kibana, send queries to the Elasticsearch to get and analyze the data you want. On top of that, you'll be able to create a dashboard with Kibana so you can visualize data in a variety of charts, tables, and maps. And this way, you can gain insights more easily and be able to share that with your stakeholders. So if you're in a situation where you need to analyze and visualize data inside Elasticsearch, Kibana will come in really handy. Okay, 
So now that you understand when to use Elasticsearch in Kibana, we'll move on to the basic architecture of Elasticsearch. So Elasticsearch is, is a powerful search and analytics engine. It's known for its distributed nature, speed, and scalability. And this is due to its unique architecture. Now, before the workshop, we had you download and run Elasticsearch on your computer. And once Elasticsearch is up and running, you now have an instance of Elasticsearch, also known as Node. Now, each node has a unique ID and a name, and it belongs to a single cluster. Now, we'll get to what that is in a little bit. Now, when you start up a node, a cluster is formed automatically, and you could have one to many nodes in a cluster. And these nodes are distributed across separate machines. But they all belong to the same cluster and work together to accomplish a task. So let's really bring this concept home. So think about a team that you have been a part of. Your team consists of multiple members who all work together to accomplish a common goal. And your team could divide and conquer by assigning each member one or multiple roles. And these are the roles that you're going to specialize in. Now, your team members may work in different buildings, but you all still belong to the same team. And this analogy could directly apply to nodes in a cluster. For example, nodes are members of a cluster that share a common goal. Now, nodes are distributed across separate machines, but they're still part of the same cluster. Nodes are assigned to one or multiple roles. And one of the roles that a node could be assigned to is to hold data. And that is what we'll be focusing on today. So data is stored as documents. And a document is a JSON object that contains whatever data you want to store in Elasticsearch. So let's go back to our online grocery shop example. Now we're helping our customers search for grocery items online. So we need to store grocery data in Elasticsearch. Now a document for one grocery item would look like this. So in a JSON object, it contains the name of the product, category it belongs in, its brand and price. And things are much easier to find when you group them in a logical manner. And documents that share similar traits and are logically related to each other are grouped into an index. So for example, documents of clementines and carrots would be grouped under produce index. Documents of Malbecs and IPAs would be grouped under wine and beer index. So to sum it up, indices are used to group documents that are related to each other. So we know where to find certain information. Okay, so let's delve into this a little bit more. So here we have a cluster of nodes. We have a produce index and wine and beer index. Now index is not actually storing documents. It's just a virtual thing that keeps track of where documents are stored. Now you can't find index on disk. What actually exists on disk is a shard. So shard is where data is stored. And this is where you run a search. So when you create an index, one shard comes with it by default. And you can configure it so that you can create an index with multiple shards that are distributed across nodes. And this is a practice called sharding. And there are a lot of superpowers that come with this practice. So let's say you have a cluster that looks like this. And you want to create a produce index that will keep track of all produce documents. Now, when you create an index, one shard is created by default. And the shard is assigned to a node. And remember, shard is where documents are stored. And number of documents a shard could hold depends on the capacity of the node. Let's say you want to index 600,000 documents in your produce index, but the node where the shard is assigned to could hold only hold 200,000 documents. Well, that's not going to work, right? Well, we do have two more nodes 
which could hold 200,000 documents each. So what you can do is you can add two additional shards in the index and distribute them across these nodes. And each shard could hold 200,000 documents. So together, they hold 600,000 documents. Now, that is all fine and dandy, but our produce data is only going to grow. So how are we going to adapt to increasing uh, data? Now that is the beauty of sharding. So you could add more shards and nodes as the need arises. So you could horizontally scale and adapt to increasing data. But that's not the only superpower that comes with sharding. Now remember, shard is where you store documents and it's also where you run search queries. So let's talk about a scenario where the client is sending a search request for pink lady apples. Now in this, in this scenario, you have one shard in a node that could hold the entire produce index. Now let's say this produce index keeps track of 500,000 documents. And we're going to run a search in the single shard, meaning we'll go through 500,000 documents sequentially. Now let's say it takes you 10 seconds to do that. Now this time, we're gonna run the same search with a different setup. So we'll have 10 shards distributed across 10 nodes, and we'll distribute 500,000 documents across 10 shards, so that each shard holds 50,000 documents each. Now, in the previous scenario, it took us 10 seconds to sequentially search through 500,000 documents. And if you do the math, running a search on 50,000 documents should take one second. Now, what's so cool about this setup is that you could run a search on all 10 of these shards at the same time in parallel. Now, guess how long it takes to search through 500,000 documents with this setup? one second. So as you can see, sharding could really speed up your search. Now in the first case, one node had to store all the info and process all incoming search. With this setup, we could only store as much data and process search requests as a single machine. Now in the second case, we distributed data across shards and allow shards to process search requests in parallel. So not only do we have the capacity to store more data, we could now search at scale. So let's say everything is going well with our online grocery shop, but all of a sudden, one of our nodes goes down and we lose our data forever. I mean, I don't even want to imagine it. I mean, that would be a nightmare. And we want to avoid this at all costs. So what we could do is we could make copies of the original shards and store its copies across different nodes. So look at nodes one and two, and these nodes contain our original shards, also known as primary shards. That's what P stands for. Now we're gonna make copies of each shard and store these in nodes three and four. And these are known as replica shards, and that's what R stands for. So R0 is a replica shard of primary shard 0. R1 is a replica shard of primary shard 1. And what this does is that if one node were to go down, everything's okay because we have a replica of our data somewhere else. But that's not all. There's an additional superpower that comes with replica shards which is it could improve the performance of your search. So let's say you have two primary shards distributed across two nodes, and you're currently getting 2,000 search queries per second, and these search queries are being ran in these two primary shards. Now, as our app is getting more popular, the search queries have increased to 8,000 queries per second and your two primary shards are having trouble keeping up with the demand. So to solve this, you could add more nodes and increase the number of replica shards of P0 and P1. 
And remember that these replicas are identical copies of the primary shards. So now these replica shards can pick up the slack and your cluster could better handle increased demands on search. All right, so now that you understand the basics of Elasticsearch, we're going to move on to the hands-on lab. So we finally get to play with Elasticsearch and Kavana. So the goal of this lab is to get familiarized with CRUD operations. So in other words, how do we create, read, update, and delete a document from Elasticsearch? Before the workshop, I've asked you to download Elasticsearch and Kibana and have these running on your computer. Now, if you didn't get a chance to do that, no worries. This meetup is recorded, so you can follow along later. Okay, so I'm going to share a GitHub repo via chat right now. Okay, so this repo contains the link to today's presentation and the blog for teaching you how to download and run Elasticsearch and Kibana, and the request we'll be using to run CRUD operations. Now, for those of you who are watching this video after the event, I will also include the repo in the description section of this video. Now, those of you who are here with me right now, click on the link to the repo and keep this tab open. Okay, so I'm just going to gloss over the part about running Elasticsearch and Kibana. Now, a lot of you have completed these steps before we started the workshop, and the step-by-step -step directions on what we're about to breeze through are included in the repo. Now, so far, I have downloaded Elasticsearch and Kibana from Elastic website, and I moved them to my desktop. Now, I unzipped both products by double-clicking on them, and on your right, what you're seeing is the unzipped folders of Elasticsearch and Kibana. Now we're going to run these two products uh, by using the command line interface. So let's pull up our terminal. Now I have three tabs open. So the first tab is running Elasticsearch. So I just CD'd into Elasticsearch, which is located in my desktop. And then I ran the command bin forward slash Elasticsearch. Now you use this command if you're on Mac or Linux. And if you're on Windows, you run bin backslash elasticsearch.bat. Now, if you are following my blog to learn how to run Elasticsearch on Windows, you could just run elasticsearch.bat. Okay, now click on your terminal and hold command F. And we're gonna look for 9200. Now you'll see an IP address ending in 9200 here. So what's that all about? Well, Elasticsearch provides a REST API that allows you to communicate with your cluster. And in other words, when you send requests to Elasticsearch, you're sending a HTTP request to this REST API whose endpoint is localhost at port 9200. So if you see this IP address and don't see any error messages, we should be good to go. Now, just make sure to keep this tab open when you're working with Elasticsearch. Otherwise, you'll shut it down. Okay, so we just talked about how Elasticsearch provides a REST API that allows you to send HTTP requests to your cluster. So let's make sure we could send a request to the REST API. So in our second tab, I ran a curl command, which sends a request to localhost 9200. Now, if you see this response with information about our cluster and version number of Elasticsearch, that means that our cluster could receive requests. Now, in the third tab, I'm running Kibana. And this is very similar to running Elasticsearch. So CD into Kibana, which is located in your desktop, and run bin forward slash Kibana if you are on Mac or Linux. Now, if you're on Windows, you can run bin backslash Kibana.bat. Now, if you are following my blog to learn how to run Kibana on Windows, then just um, run Kibana.bat. All right. Now, if you scroll down, you'll see that the server is running at localhost 5601. Copy and paste that into your browser. 
and you'll see this interface. All right. So what we just went over was the prerequisite work, and now we're going to dive into the lab. So before we get to that, let's just get organized here. So I'm going to minimize this terminal and pull up the GitHub repo I shared with you earlier. Okay. Now I'm going to wait a few seconds for you to catch up and let me know if you need me to zoom in on anything. All right, so let's get started with the lab. Just be ready to follow along on your computer. So we just downloaded and ran an instance of Elasticsearch, also known as Node. Now when you start up a node, a cluster is formed automatically. And the best practice is to name your cluster and node to something that is meaningful to you. And the reason you do that is because as your apps get bigger, you may be working with multiple clusters with multiple nodes that are responsible for different tasks. So it's really important that you could differentiate what each one does. Okay, so let's change the name of our cluster and node. So open up your terminal again and open a new tab. Now we're going to CD into Elasticsearch, which is located in our desktop. And then we're going to open it up with a text editor. Now you'll see Elasticsearch here, expand it, and then go to config directory. And then you'll see Elasticsearch.yaml file. Now this file allows you to configure a lot of things for Elasticsearch, but for today's workshop, we're only going to focus on cluster and node. Now let's scroll down to line 17, uncomment it. And we're going to change the cluster name. Now you can name this to whatever makes sense for your use case. But for our workshop, we're going to name it elastic underscore crash course. Now scroll down to node name on comment line 22. And we're going to name this crud under oops, crud underscore node. Now make sure to save it and minimize it. Now, we need to stop and restart Elasticsearch and Kibana for this name changes to take place. So go back to the terminal where you're running Elasticsearch, click on the terminal, then hold Control C. Now this is going to stop Elasticsearch. And then we're going to use the exact same command that we use to run Elasticsearch. Now it takes a couple of seconds for it to start running. So let's give that a little rest. All right, here we go. Okay, so we see the 9200 here. We're good to go. Now let's go to the terminal that's running Kibana. Click on the terminal, hold Control C to stop Kibana, and run the same command that you used to run Kibana earlier. Now this is going to take a few seconds to load up as well. All right, great. Now, Kibana is running at localhost 5601. So let's minimize our window. Okay. Now let's get organized here a little bit. So on the left, we have the Kibana interface. And on the right, we have the repo. So go back to the Kibana browser. Click on the menu icon located on the upper left corner. Scroll all the way down to management and click on DevTools. Now you'll see the Kibana console here. So on the left is where you send the request to Elasticsearch and on the right is where you receive the response from Elasticsearch. So we're going to get rid of this default search query here so we could enter our own. Okay, so we're going to start by checking the health of our cluster and the syntax will follow for that is get then API that we want to get information from and the parameter that retrieves the info that we're looking for. 
So if we're looking for information about cluster health, we would say get from cluster API health information about our cluster. So let's copy and paste that into our Kibana console. Make sure it's selected, meaning that this dark gray bar is over the request, and then click on this arrow to run it. Now we get a response from Elasticsearch, which says cluster is named Elastic Crash Course. Status is green, meaning it's healthy. Now if you look at line five, it says we have one node, which makes sense because we only have one running instance of Elasticsearch. Okay, so next we're gonna get more information about our node. So scroll down to get info about nodes in a cluster. And what we're saying here is get from nodes API stats about our nodes. So let's copy that and paste it here. Make sure to select it and run it. Okay, so we get the information about nodes. So it says we have one node in a cluster named Elastic Crash Course. Now node is named CRUD node, and then you'll see the IP address, roles, attributes, a lot of information about nodes that we're not going to go over right now. But just for now, remember that this request is really helpful when you're debugging a node because you get to inspect the node more in detail. All right, so we're going to move on to the CRUD operations. In other words, how do we create, read, update, and delete a document? So for this exercise, we're going to store documents about our favorite candy. So by now, you know that documents are logically grouped into an index. And as a best practice, we're going to create an index first. So let's get back to our repo, scroll down to create an index. So the syntax that we're going to follow is put followed by name of the index. Now, since we're indexing documents about our favorite candy, our index is going to be named favorite underscore candy all lowercase. So let's copy and paste this request here. So make sure to select it and run it. Now, if you see acknowledge true, it means that index favorite candy has been successfully created. Okay, so now that we have an index, let's index some documents. And this time I'm using index as a verb to mean that we're storing documents in Elasticsearch. So when you're indexing a document, both post or put can be used. Now you use post when you want Elasticsearch to auto generate an ID for your document. So the syntax that you're gonna follow for that is post name of the index, then document endpoint, followed by a JSON object that contains all of the data that you wanna store in a document. So in our case, we're saying post in favorite candy, the following document. So let's copy and paste that here. Make sure to select the first line of the request and send it. Now you see a 201 response, which says index favorite candy has a document with an auto generated ID. And this document has been created. Okay. Now turn to your repo and scroll up a little. Now we just mentioned that when indexing a document, document, either post or put can be used. So if you scroll down to put, now you use put when you want to assign a specific ID to your document. So a time where you might want to use this is when you're indexing data with natural identifier. So for example, let's say you're indexing patient data where each patient has a unique ID. Now documents may be easier to work with if, if it had the same ID as a patient ID rather than an auto-generated ID that has no meaning. So it's easier to keep everything uniform, right? So this time, we're going to index a couple more documents using put. So if you look at the repo, the syntax that you're gonna follow is put, name of the index, document endpoint, and ID that you want to assign to this document. 
followed by a JSON object that contains whatever information that you want to store. So in our use case, we'll say put in favorite candy index the following document and assign it an ID of one. So let's copy and paste that. Now make sure to select the first line of the request and send it. Now you'll see a 201 response that says in favorite candy index document with an assigned ID of one has been created. Now pay attention to version number one here. We'll go over this in a second. Okay, so we're going to index more documents. So I'm going to copy our last request and paste it twice. Okay, so I'm going to give this document an ID of two. And I'll say Rachel's favorite candy is Rolos. And I'm going to give the following document an ID of three and say Tom's favorite candy is mm, sweet tarts. Okay, so let's select this line here, the first line of document two and send it. Now it says in index favorite candy document with an assigned ID of two has been created. And we'll do the same for Tom's document. Select the first line and send it. Yep, a document with an ID of three has been created. Okay, so now that we have indexed some documents, I wanna send a request to see the content of the document that has been indexed. Now this is the read part of CRUD operation. So turn to your repo, scroll down to read, and the syntax that you're going to follow is get the name of the index, document endpoint, and ID of the document that you want to retrieve. So in our case, we say get from index favorite candy a document with an ID of one. So let's copy and paste that right under John's document. Make sure to select it and send it. So here we'll see a response of document with an ID of one. Now, if you look at line nine source, you'll see the content of document one. So this is a great way to check whether our CRUD operations have worked or not. Okay, so what do you think would happen if we accidentally index another document using the ID that already exists? Well, let's find out. So let's go back to the request for a document with an ID of one. I'm going to copy and paste it below. Now, I'm going to say Sally's favorite candy is Snickers. And I'm going to index this document with an existing ID of one. All right. Make sure to select the first line of the request and send it. Huh? So this looks a little bit different, right? So you get a 200 response and it says a document with an ID of one has been updated. Now, if you look at version, you'll see that it's two. So what this version is saying is how many times your document has been created, updated, or deleted. So let's just take a look to see what happened. So we're going to go back to the get request that we used and send it. Huh. So if you look at line nine, you'll see that John's document has been overwritten with Sally's. But that's not good, right? We don't actually want to overwrite a, an existing document. Now to prevent that from happening, you could use the create endpoint. So go back to your repo and scroll up to create endpoint. Now the syntax that you're going to follow is put the name of the index, then create endpoint 
an ID, you want to assign the following document. So in our case, we're saying put in favorite candy index the following document and assign it an ID of one. But if this ID already exists, then don't do anything. Just throw on error. So let's copy this request and I'm going to paste it right under Sally's. Make sure to select the first line and send it. Aha! So it's throwing a 49 error message. And the reason for that is, well, the document already exists. So let's just double check and make sure that Sally's information has not been replaced. So we'll click on get requests that we used earlier and send it. All right, good. So Sally's information still exists. Okay, so the create endpoint provides a safeguard for you so you don't accidentally overwrite your document. Okay, so let's move on to update. Scroll down to update. Now, there'll be times where you want to update an existing document. So for example, let's say Sally originally liked Snickers, but she changed her mind. Her favorite candy now is M&M's. So let's go back to our repo. And the syntax that you're going to follow is post followed by name of the index, then update endpoint, then ID of the document that you want to update. Now in a JSON object, make sure that you have doc as a context. And what this telling, what this is telling you is that, okay, I want to update this document, but only the fields with the values that I specify inside this curly bracket. So what we're seeing here, is post in favorite candy index. I want to update a document with ID of one. Now, please note that I only want to update the field candy with M&Ms. So let's copy and paste that right under Sally. Make sure to select your first line of the request and send it. Okay, so now it's saying that document one has been updated and the version number is three. Now that makes sense because document one has been originally created with John's information. Then we accidentally updated with, with Sally's. Then we purposely updated the field candy with M&Ms. Okay, so we're going to just double check to make sure everything worked. Go back to the get request that we just used and send it again. Now you'll see that document one. And if you look under source, candy has been updated to M&Ms. Okay. So the last one, at least, what if we want to delete a document? Well, this one is super simple. So let's scroll down here. Now the syntax that you're going to use is delete the name of the index, then document endpoint, then ID of the document that you want to delete. So in our case, we're saying delete from favorite candy index document with an ID of one. So let's copy that and paste it under update request for M&Ms. Okay, so to just make sure you select this request and send it. All right, now doc one has been deleted. Now version is now four. And that's a wrap for the hands on lab. Okay, so we got some great questions from our audience. So I'll answer them now. So Raymond asked, for people who come from relational database management system background like SQL Server, how does this Elastic Database compare to it? 
Well, Elasticsearch is actually not a database. It does store documents, but it's a search and analytics engine. So Elasticsearch is schema free and it's built on top of Lucene. So it's designed to excel at full text searches. Now, another differentiator is that you could really fine tune the relevance of your search results when it comes to precision, ranking, and recall. So I would say if these factors are important to you, then you might want to consider using Elasticsearch. Okay, Raymond also asked, is node like tables and clusters like servers in SQL Server? So Raymond, I do the same thing. So when I learn something new, I try to see if there's anything analogous between the system that I understand and the new product that I'm learning about. Now, I would say these are apples and oranges, so they don't really compare. Now, I feel like there's an underlying question here. So perhaps my explanation of nodes and cluster were not quite clear. So if you want to flip, follow up, feel free to email me at lisa.jung at elastic.co. Okay, so Igor asked, do the nodes use cache to find the data that is being searched? Yes, you're absolutely right. So the nodes use cache at the level of Elasticsearch and operating system, so you could retrieve information faster. Okay, so the name wasn't associated with this question in the chat, but someone asked if Linux commands are same as Mac terminal. Yes, absolutely. They're identical. Okay, so Linford asks, what is the best way to perform sharding with one node? Well, I wouldn't recommend having multiple shards in one node. And the problem with that is if your node goes down, your data is lost forever. And also, having shards in different nodes allows you to perform searches in parallel. So perhaps there's something that I don't quite understand about your use case. So if you want to follow up, you could email me at my email address here. Okay, so Raymond asked, what are some disadvantages with using Elasticsearch? Now, I don't think you can have a generic answer to this question about any products, really. It really depends on what you're working with and what you're trying to accomplish. So if I were to decide on which products to use, I think about the metrics that are really important in my use case and pick products that are best fit for that. So based on your questions, um, it seems like you come from the SQL world. So I know that Elasticsearch doesn't support joins or transactions. But then again, it's about choosing products that are best fit for your use case and weighing the pros and cons based on what you're working with. Okay, so Partha asked, at which point does using Elasticsearch give value versus searching through a SQL database, empirically in size of database? Note that there's an overhead in maintaining yet another microservice. Okay, so I get a sense that the underlying question here is you're trying to determine whether Elasticsearch might be a fit for your use case. Now, this question is hard to answer without clearly understanding the problems that you're trying to solve. So if you have a list of metrics that really matter to your use case and are open to sharing it with me, I'd be happy to connect you with someone that specializes in that area so you can make a decision that is best for you. Christopher asks, do you have any experience and or can you recommend using Redis with an established ELT stack? Now, I haven't used Redis with an established Elastic stack. And this question is hard to answer without knowing what you're using Redis for. So if you'd like to follow up and share that with me via email, then I could share that with a team member who might be more familiar with it. Now, I think the best way to get this question answered is by using the Discuss forum. So we have a huge global developer community, and they use the Elastic Stack in diverse use cases with various setups. So someone in the community might have experience with Redis and guide you in the right direction. Now, I included the link to the Discuss forum here and in the description of the video. Okay, so Raymond asked, What's with the errors and warnings? So what he's referring to is the error messages that he saw while Kibana is loading. So the whole point of running Elasticsearch and Kibana together is so that we could send requests to Elasticsearch from Kibana. So when we start up Kibana, it's immediately trying to send requests to Elasticsearch. Now remember, 
When we start up Elasticsearch, it takes some time to fully get up and running. And during the demo, while Elasticsearch was still loading, I fired up Kibana. So what you're seeing is Kibana trying to send requests to Elasticsearch and failing because Elasticsearch has not been fully loaded to connect to Kibana yet. Okay, last question. Partha asked, does Elasticsearch have support to secure 9200 and 5601? authentication, tokens, and etc. Yes, so you can secure your cluster for free by adding user authentication and encrypted communications. So here are some resources to get you started. And I'll also include these links in the description of this video as well. All right, so if you like the beginner's crash course to the Elastic Stack, remember that this is a series of workshops. Now I'm planning a second workshop in January and we'll talk about more advanced stuff that you could do with Elasticsearch and build on what we've learned. Now, if you want to be updated on our next workshop, join the Elastic Austin user group. I'll be posting our next workshop info here. And I'll include a link to this meetup group in the description. Okay, so last but not least, if you have any questions about the content of my presentation, feel free to send me an email. Now, if you have more general questions, then the discussion forum is a great place to get your questions answered. So we have a huge archive of questions asked and answered by developers, and we have a really active community answering questions and also a great team of developer advocates monitoring this forum as well. Now, also, I'm going to be blogging a lot about Elasticsearch. So if you prefer to learn by reading instead, be sure to check out my blog. And lastly, I wanted to thank Phoebe Quincy, our community program associate, for hosting this workshop with me. Now, without her, the series doesn't run. So thank you. All right. So that's a wrap. And I'll see you guys next year.